Hi, everybody. My name is Jessica Kim, and I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Ionicare. Um, we know a lot of you guys are going through a lot of different changes, so we just wanted to pull together some strategies for working caregivers during this whole COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so what I'd love to always start with is this powerful quote, which Rosalind Carter says, there are only four types of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. And it just speaks to the fact that every single one of us is gonna be impacted by caregiving in some shape or form, and yet it's still so hidden. And unlike life events like weddings or having a baby, we don't often share or talk about caregiving for a loved one. And yet there are millions of us and we've all been thrusted into it. No one plans on becoming a caregiver. In fact, this is my beautiful mom. Um, and she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and she battled it for seven and a half years. And they moved in with me and I was thrust into that role of just navigating all of her care and caring for her. And she eventually passed away uh, in my home in 2017. And now, as you can see on the bottom, um, with COVID-19 happening, uh, my dad has moved in with me. He's 81 years old. He has uh, major heart issues and doesn't know how to cook. So as soon as the restaurants closed, uh, he had to come right over. Um, and so I'm just really grateful to be here today to kind of connect with all of you as we're all trying to figure it out together. Um, you know, it's, it's the, even pre-COVID, the, the numbers were staggering that one out of seven people are uh, really reliant on a family caregiver. And um, it's really accelerated with COVID-19. Uh, it's expanded the role of caregiving and uh, how we define it. Um, and it's drastically changed all of our lives and it's continuing to change our lives. Um, so whether we're caring for someone who has had a chronic illness, um, if you're caring for someone or a child with autism, um, if you're worried about your elderly parents uh, and you're caring for them remotely, or if you're one of the thousands of people who are still working on the front lines while juggling all the family responsibilities and care uh, when you don't have a lot of support, um, it's really to redefine the way we care and the way we should think about it. And so today our major goal uh, is really um, uh, to, especially with this month being Mental Health Awareness Month, it's really to shape our approach and mindset uh, to caregiving. And so the framework that we're gonna use is actually inspired by my dad, who was a psychiatrist for many decades, he's brilliant. And he has always said that with his patients, the number one key thing to overcome any challenge is to one, you wanna acknowledge it, and two, you wanna be aware of how you typically respond, and then three, it's time to make a choice. And I think, especially with caregiving, we often feel thrust into this situation. We don't plan on it, we don't want it. I mean, we don't wanna see our loved ones suffer um, and go through their health issues. Um, and we often say, my gosh, well, I had no choice. Like, I have no choice, which makes us feel completely helpless, right? But you do have a choice. You know, there are plenty of people who choose to walk away, who choose not to care, who choose not to care enough to even watch a webinar like this, but you are here and you chose to lean in and you are choosing to figure this out. And so I'm gonna walk you through three major realities um, in, in this area of caregiving for someone who has a chronic illness or, um, and we're gonna name it. We're gonna name it and we're going to walk away with how we choose to respond. And so the things I'm going to cover is how do we reduce stress, how do we gain strength, and how do we redefine care without contact? And so, um, you know, in comments or, uh, you know, I would love to hear just how a lot of you are just dealing with stress. Are you dealing with any kind of stress in the last month? It's almost a rhetorical question, okay, because I think the answer is yes. But it gets us in this habit of sharing and naming it for ourselves because, you know what, the stress is real. It is hard, and as caregivers, it has always been hard, but COVID-19 has made it even harder. And when things get tough, what do we typically do? We typically respond by hiding it. We hide it, we don't share about it, we fear judgment, we worry about losing our job. Um, and when we, we often also put higher pressure on ourselves, especially if we fall into a category where there are a lot of preconceived notions. 
right? So for example, a lot of women are struggling with the fact that um, they already feel like people assume that it's impossible to have it all, that it's impossible to have your kids at home as well as um, caring for someone who has a chronic illness and still get your job done. And so what we do is we pretend that we have it all together, that we got this um, because we don't want to take ourselves out of the running race. Um, you know, I just talked to a husband caregiver who recently hid the fact that he was caring for his wife who had early onset dementia for years. And uh, he didn't want it to be an excuse. And um, so he didn't tell anybody and his team. And it took him three heart attack, like panic episodes, three of them before he even told his boss for the first time. And so what we can do here is not wait for those heart attack, like panic episodes, and we can choose to respond in a different way. We have to acknowledge first that this is not an excuse. If you think about what an excuse is, it's kind of a white lie or a lie to get out of something, right? Caregiving is not a lie, it is a fact. It's a huge part of our reality. Um, and so we, we don't want it, it's not an excuse at all. And um, it was only until he really shared it with his team and his, uh, and his boss that he was blown away by how they, they responded. Um, they were more flexible. They showered him with resources that his company had. Um, and, and so, you know, I think when we share, we want to believe that people will understand. Because if we really believe that stat and that quote that we read in the beginning, that every single person is going to be impacted by caregiving, then when you tell someone, they will probably have some kind of context as to what that is. And so just believe that they will embrace you and they will respond. But we know it's still hard. And so some practical tips here is, Set aside intentional time with your shift manager, with your boss, with your team, whoever you work with, make, say, you know, can I get 10 minutes of your time and tell them intentionally, don't wait until your performance goes down or um, that you're, uh, that it's a side comment or that they find out in some other way, uh, set aside a special time and COVID-19 is the perfect time to share this about yourself because it's on top of mind for everybody. You want to be realistic with expectations and super specific with your asks and needs. Um, the specificity is the number one thing that makes a difference, right? Ask to move your shift 15 minutes. Say that you can't meet at 7 a.m. because you have to get everyone settled. Um, be as specific as possible because the worst case scenario is that they say no, but they probably will suggest something else. Um, and if you're a manager listening to this, just know that you are your employee's and team member's first responder. You are the first responder in their life. You're probably the first one to know when they are extra tired or something is a little off. And so what you wanna do is make sure that you know the resources that your company offers that you can share with that person. And first, just be human. Your job initially is to be a human ear to listen and to ask questions and to really embrace them. And then you wanna set phase-based expectations. And I say phase-based because it's not a one and done deal, right? It, you know, caregiving progresses and so just take phase by phase, set very clear expectations until things change and then set those expectations for that next phase. So the next thing that we're talking about is gaining strength and gaining strength in, the, in, in a time where you may be feeling weaker. Um, we are more isolated than ever. We have surveyed thousands of people and um, you know it's, it's fascinating to hear that the number one reason why help is not exchanged is because people feel like a burden. They feel like a burden and the social distancing um, has increased that feeling of burden tenfold, right? Because I mean, how can I ask you for help when you're just dealing with all of these major changes of COVID-19 as well? And so I just won't ask at all. And so our typical response in those situations is, I'm okay, I got this, don't worry about it. Um, you know, I'll just do it myself and I don't wanna feel needy, I hate feeling helpless. Um, and because of that feeling in so many cultures, we've been obsessed with returning that favor immediately, right? It's okay for me to borrow 10 bucks from you if I forget my wallet for lunch, um, but it's because I can you know, repay you the very next day. Uh, but it's so much harder to receive help when, you know, how can I repay you for helping me care for a very sick parent that may be dying? It feels impossible. And so I don't want to feel that debt and so I just won't ever receive that help. Um, and so we worked with this caregiver who is obsessed with paying people back and just is always making everything equal. And when she had to care for her mom who suffered a stroke, it was really difficult for her to accept help. 
So she completely got to the point where she burnt out, where she could no longer care for her family members anymore. Um, you know, there's a staggering statistic that 30% of caregivers pass away before that they, the person that they are caring for, 30%. Isn't that tragic? That's tragic on so many levels. And it's because we're neglecting our own health. We don't ask for enough help. Um, and the one thing holding her back in that situation was that feeling of, of shame and feeling bad and feeling needy. Um, and that's why she didn't ask for support. And so it's something that we can overcome by something that only you can do. And it's your choice. And you can choose to believe and know that this type of work is priceless. It cannot be repaid back, so don't even try. It's just in a totally different bucket and we can choose, choose to believe that. And we can choose to gain strength in numbers. Um, you know, it's actually very courageous to ask for help. Um, before you think of anyone else though, it really is about, you know, having a contract with yourself, right? I think that's what we're learning here is like empowering yourself to say, um, when this happens to me, I'm going to share it. I'm going to invite people in and I'm going to, um, I'm going to receive that help. But in order to do that, I mean, the biggest thing that we hear from people is, I, well, I don't have a support team. I, you know, cause we think that has to be our closest, closest friends, or we have to have a lot of healthy family members around us. And a lot of us don't have that. And so we say, you know, well, I don't have a support team, but the thing is we have to expand the view of who can be on our support team. Right, however big or small, we um, interact with people in our daily lives. And so people from our, our church, um, you know, people in our running club, other fellow parents, um, these, uh, you know, uh, neighbors, you know, however big or small, we interact with these people and they don't have to be our bestest, bestest friends to show up. It's, you know, whenever they see that you're caregiving or you tell them in a side comment, they often say, oh my gosh, Josh, you know, let me know how I can help. And that is an invitation that you don't just say, oh, I'm okay, but you say, okay, well, I have an ionic care support team. I have a support team, come join it. And some of you may respond, yeah, but you know, during this time, like I can't have people touch you know, our house or my loved ones, so we just cannot accept help. And so we have to reframe it and say, there's care without contact. There are plenty of ways that people can help you during this time. They can order groceries for you. They can take out the trash. They can run the errands so you can stay safely home and not um, expose yourself to this virus. Uh, they can schedule virtual check-ins. They can buy you gift cards. There are so many ways where you can get that support. So we have to think care without contact and how do we shift the way that we ask for help. And so if you're a manager here uh, listening to this, it's up to you again as a first responder to ignite that support, ignite that support team. You know, keep your uh, working caregiver accountable for receiving that support, rally people. Um, you can be the starter of what can make a huge difference uh, in this person's life. And so the last thing we're gonna talk about is redefine what it means to care, especially if you're caring remotely. So it goes without saying that this is a really crazy time right this is a time where um visiting our loved ones could actually like put them in major harm right and so um it leaves us feeling very hopeless and helpless and powerless i mean like what can we do in this situation um and so when we feel like this our typical response tends to be that we get paralyzed we get paralyzed by the fear we get paralyzed by um this helplessness and it digs us deeper into denial because that's easier to grasp. Um, and our parents may be stubborn. I mean, how many of you have stubborn parents um, or family dynamics that are just so complex and, and hurtful? Um, and we often feel like with caregiving, it's you're all in or it's nothing. And with all these overwhelming facts, sometimes it's easier to say it's nothing. But as we talk to hundreds um, of caregivers and just people, they have said that their top regret, regret was always not doing enough. But instead of thinking of that and hearing that and feeling guilt, I think what we could do is we can, we can choose to respond differently. We can choose to say, you know what, I'm gonna create a plan of things that I can do that is doable just to stay involved. I don't need to feel like I'm their savior, but I just wanna stay involved and not let the restrictions that we're all dealing with restrict the way that we show love. Um, and so let's redefine what remote care looks like and let's see it as an opportunity where we can actually connect 
more because we're not relying on those occasional visits. Um, and so this is a case where it really becomes more tactical, okay? So this is where you have to create a support team. Um, and, 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 and it's possible because you're only looking to for two to three supporters that are local to the person that you're caring for remotely, right? And this doesn't have to be your close friends and family or, you know, honestly, the person you're caring for, they don't have to even know that person because that person's helping you extend that care. Um, so a neighbor, a church member, um, you know, any other kind of group. And what you want to do is you want to have a plan. So asking for last minute requests is really hard for everybody. But if you say, hey, every Tuesday, can you just go grocery shopping and get the basics? And the basics are these five things. Um, on Friday, can you check in to make sure they take their medication? You could do it from afar. They can do it through a window and be very specific because the number one reason why supporters don't help or act is because they don't know what to do, right? They don't know what you need. They don't want to offend you. They don't want to intrude. They, they want to help, but they just don't know. So the more specific you are, the more that it makes it easier for them to actually act. Um, and then you want to also um, stay connected. Uh, sometimes during this time, it's all about logistics and it's all about their health. And no one likes that. This is still someone who you really care about. So uh, words with friends or all these other online games where you can play back and forth, um, you know, get into a little fun battle is a really great way to stay connected really emotionally or, you know, set up a virtual, um, uh, you know, check-in or uh, a meal together, you know, Saturday brunch is a very popular thing. Um, but it's really important to emotionally check in with them as well. And then the last thing is just care packages. You know, you can, on a practical level, have things sent to them on an ongoing basis for their basic needs. But then also don't forget about those chocolate covered pretzels or whatever really makes them uh, just feel really happy. Um, and so, you know, as you know, we have uh, our free app that mobilizes all these personal social circles to just kind of lift the burden around the logistics to so people can really show up and help around these practical things and it keeps everyone updated. Um, but I wanna end you with the fact uh, that this is a, a crazy time for all of us and we are always thinking of you and our whole mission is to make sure that even though that we're figuring out the solutions that you are not alone in this. And so don't do this alone. You know, IANA Care stands for I am not alone care. Um, and so uh, we leave you with that. We are thinking of you, we embrace you, we hug you um, and have a really, really great day.